ديبيت كتيرة فيها دسكشن كتيرة فإن شاء الله نأمل إن إحنا نستفيد كلنا من الدسكشن ونشارك كمان في الأسئلة اللي هتبقى موجودة على الشات أي حد من حضراتكم عايز يسأل أسئلة هنجمعها في الآخر ونجاوب عليها ازيك يا محمد انا مش عارف سامعني ولا لا اه سامعين حضرتك كويس قوي أيوة وشايفين صوره حضرتك كمان منور مساء الفل اهلا وسهلا مساء الخير كل سنه وانتم طيبين وانت بالصحه والسلامه الايام دي ايام اعياد وكريسماس وراس السنه وبعدين مبروك لل... للفرقه اللي نجحت في الدكتوراه دي آه صحيح احنا النهارده طلعنا النتيجه كان داخل امتحان التحريري 17 طالب دكتوراه نجح 11 ودي نسبه كويسه حاجه و60% تعتبر من افضل نسب ضمن سام كليه الطب ففعلا كل التهاني وان شاء الله ربنا يجعل ايام السنه كلها اعياد يا دكتور شريف ان شاء الله ان شاء الله انتوا تحبوا نبتدي لو نستنى بس دقيقتين ثلاثه عشان الناس تتجمع اكثر والدكتور جلال باين في اليمن بيكرم هناك وبعت صور <تصفيق> والصور الصور ظهر ما فيش كورونا هناك خالص صحيح هو الدكتور جلال بيكرم فيرتشوال من خلال مؤتمر جامعه صنعاء رئيس المؤتمر هو الدكتور طه الميموني احد طلاب اسم القلب الحقيقه هو خريج القصر العيني واخد دكتوراه من عندنا هم كرموني انا كمان في اليوم اللي بعديه الحقيقه وبرده فيرتشوال ونسبه الحضور كانت حلوه جدا لكن طبعا ما حسيت زي ما حضرتك قلت ان ما فيش حد لابس ماسك في القاعه عندهم يعني وهو بالمناسبه انا عملت لهم دعوه ان هم كمان يعني اللينك بتاع الميتنج بتاعتنا بتاعت النهارده بتاعت حضرتك بعتها للدكتور طه رئيس المؤتمر عشان برضو طلاب العلم في اليمن كله يقدروا يدخلوا يبقوا موجودين معانا وفعلا معانا ناس منهم انا شايف على الشات الحقيقه بيردوا علينا دكتور نادر العامري اهلا بيك طب دي حاجه حلوه اه لو تحب تعمل انميوت وتقول لنا انطباعك ايه عن المؤتمر تمام فزي ما حضرتك شايف احنا العدد دلوقتي 29 لو تحب حضرتك نبدا احنا جاهزين خلاص احمد موجود ولا لا؟ انا موجود مع حضرتك دكتور شريف مع حضرتك الحمد لله ازي حضرتك يا فندم ازي صحه حضرتك؟ لا احمد ده اصعب حاجه في البرزنتيشن دي عشان عشان تلاقيه بقى وعشان يجي وعشان يظهر اصعب حاجه احمد شحاته اهلا بيك يا احمد اهلا بحضرتك دكتور شريف تحت امر حضرتك دكتور شريف احمد هو احد نجوم اسم القلب الحقيقه أحمد بيثبت إن هو يعني فارس من الطراز الأول هو مسؤول دلوقتي إداري عن رعاية القلب المركزة في اسم 23 والحقيقة في كل مهمة بكلفه بيها بيقوم يقوم بيها يعني على الوجه الأكمل وبرضه في الإيميجينج الحقيقة من فرسان الاسم فأنا بهنيك يا دكتور شريف على اختيارك أحمد يكون موجود معانا النهاردة. شكرا يا دكتور محمد شكرا جزيلا. طيب احنا هنتكلم عن الـ عن الدايوريتكس ان دي كومبنسيتد هارت فيلير يعني دي حاجه ايفري داي براكتس وحاجه سهله از ات ريلي سهله ولا لا أه هنشوف فالبرزنتيشن هنتكلم بريفلي عن الميكانيزمز اوف كونجيشن وبعدين عن النفرون فانكشن ان هارت فيلير and uh, with diuretic therapy. وبعدين الدكتور أحمد هيكلم بقى الكلام الـ الـ practical المفيد عن uh, how to use uh, diuretics وإيه dosing regimens 
with diuretic resistance, with pharmacokinetics, with pharmacodynamics. Uh, next, please. The, these are the main uh, pathophysiologic uh, components of the heart failure uh, syndrome. And as you can see from uh, the direction of the arrows, you know, uh, you know they, they uh, can all uh, co-stimulate uh, each other. Well, in the center is, is uh, neurohormonal stimulation. This is in the center of uh, pathophysiology. And uh, there are two main systems, the natriuretic peptides, our uh, uh, salutary system, while the sympathetic nervous system, uh, renin angiotensin system, and arginine vasopressin uh, are adaptive in the short term, uh, mal maladaptive in the long term. And they are the main cause for uh, sodium and water retention and expansion of the extracellular uh, volume. Venous congestion is uh, best defined hemodynamically by an increase in cardiac filling pressures. More than uh, six to eight mean right atrial pressure, more than 15 mean left ventricular uh, filling uh, pressure. And the, uh, the initial stimulus for neurohormonal activation is not very clear. The traditional theory is that cardiac dysfunction results in reduction in cardiac output or in the ejection fraction with arterial uh, underfilling. This stimulates the baroreceptors and uh, neurohormonal uh, stimulation. But the cardiac output is often not reduced in, uh, in decompensated Actually, the majority of patients present with venous congestion. 90% of patients present with congestion. Few patients present with the poor perfusion or reduction in uh, cardiac output. And the stimulus may actually be increased cardiac filling pressures. The baroreceptors in this case may be situated in the in the pulmonary circulation, in the low pressure circulation, and not uh, the arterial and uh, aortic arch and carotid body uh, baroreceptors. Venous congestion has two hemodynamics phenotypes. One is created with increased extracellular volume, um, and the other uh, is associated actually with normal extracellular volume. Uh, but uh, of course, there is increased cardiac uh, filling pressures. Next, please. So, uh, as you know, these are the compartments of body water. Body water constitutes two thirds of the body weight, uh, intracellular compartment, two thirds extracellular compartment one third. The extracellular compartment divides into interstitial two thirds and intravascular one third. And the intravascular divides into venal, which contains two thirds of the intravascular uh, volume and arterial. And the venous, the major venous reservoir is in the splanchnic bed. The splanchnic venous reservoir is a large, uh, low compliance, high capacity uh, reservoir uh, that contains two thirds of the uh, blood in the venous circulation. And um, the splanchnic veins are richly supplied by sympathetic nerve fibers. So they're under control of the sympathetic uh, nervous system. So during exercise, or when you assume uh, the upright posture, 
or early in the development of uh, heart failure. Sympathetic stimulation empties this venous reservoir and causes a redistribution of blood from the splanchnic bed to the central uh, circulation. And this results in increased cardiac filling pressures and initiates the uh, heart failure, vicious circle or heart failure syndrome. Next, please. So uh, patients with uh, heart failure may have expanded extra intravascular volume or normal intravascular volume. And um, so the cardiac filling pressures may be elevated with normal volume. There may be uncoupling of filling pressures and uh, volume. And of course, the, there is uh, an area of overlap. The clinical clue to volume expansion is gaining weight. And the uh, patients with decompensated heart failure usually do not present acutely as we, as we think or as we say acute decompensated. Usually it's a more insidious process. Uh, where the patient progressively gains weight with expansion of volume and then develops the manifestations of overt uh, congestion. Uh, patients with normal volemia will not have uh, gain in weight before uh, they, they present to hospital. Next, please. And uh, this is a study in patients with chronic congestive heart failure, actually. And you can see that uh, less than 50% uh, of the patients were eovolemic. They, in this study, the, these were patients with class three congestive heart failure. They measured the blood volume with radioactive albumin. They measured cardiac function uh, with the uh, echocardiographic uh, parameters and um, um, and they measured cardiac filling pressures by intracardiac catheters. And uh, uh, less than half the patients did not have hypervolemia. Uh, yet in these patients who are eovolemic, the, the cardiac filling pressures are elevated in 60% of these patients. The important point here is that uh, diuretic therapy is primarily indicated in patients with hypervolemia, with, uh, with expanded extracellular volume. This is what diuretics do. They reduce the uh, intravascular volume. Um, the prototype for uh, patients who have uh, heart failure, uh, pulmonary edema, and yet, not have hypervolemia is actually pulmonary edema associated with hypertensive crisis. And in these patients, the primary uh, uh, means of therapy should not be diuretics as, as often is the practice here and everywhere actually, but it should be vasodilators and antisympathetic drugs to reduce uh, the blood pressure. Diuretics may be used, but as a second line of uh, management. Next. And uh, this is um, a, a model for prediction of what happens early in heart failure. Early in heart failure, uh, there is a sympathetic stimulation, probably due to increased cardiac filling pressures. And probably it, it comes and goes with exercise. And this mobilizes the uh, venous reservoir in the splanchnic circulation, increases the central circulatory volume and increases cardiac filling pressures. Later on, sympathetic activation acts on the kidneys and induce salt and water retention. And, uh, and then congestion becomes chronic and becomes uh, sustained. Next, please. Venous congestion is a, a deleterious uh, uh, 
manifestation of, uh, of heart failure with far-reaching uh, effects. Venous congestion is a potent stimulus for uh, sympathetic nervous system and, uh, and uh, hence for the renin angiotensin system and for arginine uh, vasopressin. And uh, long-term venous congestion is pro-inflammatory and is associated with cytokine stimulation. And it has uh, uh, damaging effects on the myocardium, on the kidneys, and on, on other organs. Local venous congestion, also splanchnic congestion, stimulates the sympathetic nervous system and sends uh, reflexes to the kidney that increase uh, renin activity. And splanchnic congestion, of course, impairs the intestinal uh, barrier to the production of toxins uh, and, and hormones, and these toxins and hormones reduce the glomerular filtration rate. Local renal congestion uh, is a major factor in salt and water retention in, in patients with heart failure, and we will come to this point later on. Next, please. So this is what diuretic therapy does. Uh, diuretic therapy uses the physiologic action of the kidney. They induce, they enhance renally mediated natriuresis and aquauresis or diuresis. And this leads to reduction of intravascular volume. The cardiac filling pressures are reduced. Now, because the uh, intravascular compartment and the interstitial compartment are osmotically connected, then plasma refilling occurs from the interstitial tissue to the intravascular compartment. The interstitial volume is reduced and, and uh, the manifestations of edema are also reduced. Next, please. And this is the the nephron, uh, because the site of action of diuretics uh, is the nephron. And, and the kidney is a, a very unique, very special vascular organ. The kidney is a vascular organ. And the uh, uh, glomerular uh, capillaries are, are unlike any other capillary bed in the body because they are supplied by a feeding afferent arteriole and, um, uh, uh, and, a, uh, and they lead into uh, an efferent arteriole. All capillary beds in the body are supplied by an arteriole and they empty into a venule or a vein. And uh, uh, except the glomerular capillaries. And this uh, helps very well to mediate the glomerular filtration, uh, which is the main uh, function uh, of the kidneys. The glomerular capillaries differ from other capillaries in, in three main factors. The first is that they are supplied by an arteriole and they drain into an arteriole. Both arterioles have smooth muscle cells and are capable of contracting and relaxing. And so they are capable of maintaining a high pressure in the glomerular capillaries, uh, which, is, uh, which leads to glomerular filtration. After the efferent arteriole, the, the vascular system breaks into a network of peritubular capillaries. And you can see them here. And the pressure in the, in the glomerular capillary is very high, but the pressure in the peritubular capillaries is very low. So we have two systems in series. A high pressure system that is suitable for filtration and a low pressure system around 
the tubules uh, that is adapted to uh, reabsorption. The peritubular capillaries uh, finally lead into uh, the renal veins. And if you take a cross section uh, at the where the in any part of the tubule, like we have the proximal tubule, then the descending loop of Henel, then the ascending loop of Henel, uh, then the distal tubule and the collecting duct. So if you take a, a cross section uh, at the at the descending loop of Henel or in the proximal tubule here, uh, you will have four compartments. You will have the lumen uh, of the renal tubule, and then you will have the renal uh, epithelial cells, and then the interstitial compartment, and then uh, the, the, the capillary or the vascular compartment. And the lumen of the renal tubule uh, of the epithelial cell is is separated from the interstitial tissue by the cell membrane, by a bilipid layer cell membrane that has very different characteristics from the endothelium that separates the interstitial tissue from uh, the capillaries. You can also see here that uh, eventually this goes to venous drainage. And in case of venous congestion, the pressure will rise in the peritubular capillaries, but it will also rise in the interstitial tissue and in the renal tubules, actually, because the kidney is enclosed, is an encapsulated organ. So the pressure rises uh, in all three compartments. And this has important effects on uh, absorption by the, the absorption function of the tubules. Next, please. And the, the kidneys are supplied by one fifth of the cardiac output. And um, uh, if you consider the hematocrit, then the renal plasma flow is 625 milliliters per minute. The glomerular filtration rate, the norm, normal glomerular filtration rate is 120 milliliters per minute. And this comprises 180 liters per day. This unique vascular structure, the kidney has to deal with 180 liters of fluid per day. First filtration, and then reabsorption of all but two liters which form urine. 99% is reabsorbed. The filtration fraction is the ratio of glomerular filtration rate to renal plasma flow. And normally it is 20%. And if you use this equation, then the glomerular filtration rate would equal renal plasma flow times the filtration fraction. And this is important because in conditions where renal perfusion, blood pressure, cardiac output, or is re reduced, like in hemorrhage, like in congestive heart failure. And renal perfusion tends to be reduced. Any reduction in renal plasma flow can be compensated by an increase in filtration fraction. So as to keep the GFR constant. And this is the basis of autoregulation in the renal circulation. The GFR, looking at, uh, at it from another point of view, uh, is also equal to the KF. KF is the coefficient of filtration of the glomerular capillary barrier uh, times the net filtration pressure, the difference between hydrostatic capillary pressure and plasma osmotic uh, pressure. 
The coefficient of filtration in the glomerular capillary circulation is higher than any peripheral capillary circulation. Uh, it is calculated as milliliters per minute per millimeter mercury to account for the filtration, net filtration pressure per 100 grams of, of renal tissue. And it is 400 times larger than the coefficient of filtration in the peripheral capillaries. There is a, a huge facilitation of filtration in, in this capillary uh, vascular bed. And again, this is one of the factors that characterize the glomerular capillaries and that preserve the glomerular filtration rate when there is any reduction in the filtration pressure. This very high coefficient of permeability or filtration maintains the GFR uh, despite the reduction in filtration pressure. Next, please. So this is the uh, uh, glomerular capillaries and the afferent arteriole and the efferent arteriole. And the uh, uh, forces that lead to glomerular filtration are the usual starling forces. Capillary hydrostatic pressure stimulates filtration the osmotic pressure of plasma proteins opposes filtration. The hydrostatic pressure in, in Bowman's capsule is very low and it opposes filtration. And the protein pressure in Bowman's capsule is also, oncotic pressure is very low. So mainly the GFR depends on the difference between the capillary hydrostatic pressure and the oncotic pressure of uh, plasma proteins. And because there is always a possibility to dilate the afferent arteriole and constrict the efferent arteriole, then you can always maintain or enhance the rate of filtration in situations where the renal blood flow is, is compromised by increasing the filtration fraction. Next, please. And so uh, th this is the, what happens in the glomerular capillaries at the afferent arteriolar uh, end. The pressure in the afferent arteriole is 60 millimeters of mercury. In the renal artery, it is 100. Uh, close to the afferent arteriole, the capillary hydrostatic pressure is nearly 45. The plasma protein oncotic pressure is 23. And so the driving pressure or the net filtration pressure is 22. As you go through towards the efferent arteriole in the glomerular capillaries, the hydrostatic pressure is reduced slightly. First, because of filtration, and second, because of the resistance in the capillary circulation. Uh, but as filtration occurs, the concentration of plasma proteins, which are not part of the filtrate, increases. And so as the hydrostatic pressure is slightly reduced, the plasma or the capillary uh, oncotic pressure is actually markedly reduced. And it is re incre markedly increased. It's increased from 23 to 40. Uh, at the uh, at the efferent arteriolar end. And so there comes a point where the two pressures are equal and there is no net filtration. Filtration stops.
this system has the benefit of sustaining a high hydrostatic pressure all through the capillary circulation. And, uh, and also the, the increase in osmotic pressure at the efferent arteriolar end has important effects on the peritubular capillary circulation and on renal absorption mechanisms later on. Next, please. So this is the, uh, how renal autoregulation is maintained. In the upper panel, whenever the renal arterial pressure or renal perfusion is reduced, the resistance in the afferent arteriole is reduced and the resistance in the efferent arteriole is increased. And so in the middle panel, this leads to a sustained increase in capillary hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus and increases the filtration fraction. The normal filtration fraction is 20, but in heart failure, the filtration fraction may reach as high as 60%. And this tends to maintain uh, the GFR as, as much as possible. One point here, however, that you should notice and know a sustained increase in filtration fraction and the sustained increase uh, in the capillary hydrostatic pressure is injurious, is detrimental on the long term to the glomerular capillary membrane, to the glomerular mesangium, and um, to, to kidney function. And, and eventually it leads to deterioration of, of renal function and to fibrosis and loss of nephrons. Next, please. So these are the mechanisms of autoregulation. First, there is the myogenic response, and this is simply a response of the smooth muscle cells of the afferent arteriole. When the renal flow is reduced, the afferent arteriole dilates, and if renal flow is increased, the opposite occurs. Tubuloglomerular feedback is a function of the macula densa. And the macula densa is also responsible together with the central sympathetic nervous system uh, for uh, renin secretion. Next. This is the juxtaglomerular apparatus. And it consists of uh, the specialized epithelial cells of the renal tubule of the macula densa. This is at the junction of the ascending uh, limb of the loop of Hennel with, uh, with the distal convoluted tubule. And these specialized epithelial cells, they act as volume receptors. They sense the changes in uh, urine flow. Specifically, they sense what is delivered to the macula densa uh, of the chloride ions. And uh, being in close proximity to the uh, afferent renal arteriole, they change the diameter of the afferent arteriole through paracrine secretion of uh, nitric oxide, of prostaglandins, and of other mediators, um, so that when they sense a reduction in the volume, they dilate the afferent arteriole. And uh, on the other hand, when the volume increases, they induce paracrine secretion of adenosine, which constricts the afferent arteriole. This is the tubuloglomerular feedback. In addition, surrounding the afferent arteriole are granular cells. Uh, in this figure, the juxtaglomerular cells, granular cells that uh, are the site of storage of the peptide, the enzyme renin. And again, 
uh, reduced flow or reduced chloride delivery to the macula densa stimulates renin release. And renin increases the level of angiotensin II. Angiotensin also stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, arginine, vasopressin, and all these hormones, they constrict both afferent and efferent arterioles, but they constrict the efferent arteriole to a larger extent than the afferent arteriole, and hence they increase the capillary hydrostatic pressure, they increase the filtration fraction and tend to maintain the uh, GFR whenever the renal perfusion is reduced. Next, please. And this is a cross section uh, at the level of the macula densa. So the, the yellow lumen is the lumen of the, the tubule. The, the green cells are the tubular epithelial cells. The interstitial tissue is, is blue. And then uh, the peritubular capillaries are uh, in red. And um, in the normal uh, situation, there is sufficient delivery of chloride ions to the macula densa uh, cells. And um, they um, attach to a, a transporter, a sodium, potassium, two chloride ion uh, co-transporter, uh, which which results in reabsorption of sodium and chloride and potassium uh, to the uh, interstitial cells and back to, back to the capillary uh, circulation. In heart failure, when the epithelial macular denser cells sense a reduction in chloride uh, ions, uh, they uh, increase the activity of nitric oxide synthase and uh, cyclooxygenase COX-2. Uh, they produce, therefore, uh, vasodilatation of the afferent renal arteriole, and they increase the production of uh, renin. Next, please. So these are... This is a summary of the factors that affect renal blood flow and, and GFR in, in heart failure. It is reduced by neurohormonal stimulation, by increased cardiac filling pressures, by venous congestion, of course. Uh, renal venous congestion. The renal blood flow by Ohm's law equals the pressure difference, renal arterial pressure minus renal venous pressure divided by uh, the uh, vascular resistance in the renal circulation. So when the renal venous pressure is elevated, uh, renal blood flow is reduced. And there are many studies that show that when you reduce venous congestion, renal blood flow increases and improves. A reduction in cardiac output, possibly in some cases, increased intra-abdominal pressure also reduces the gamma filtration rate. And of course, aggressive diuresis where there is a contraction of the uh, intravascular uh, circulation. On the other hand, the GFR is maintained because of a high filtration coefficient because of renal autoregulation, tubular glomerulus Mr. from the macula densa, and that increases the filtration fraction. And of course, the natriuretic peptide system uh, also helps to uh, maintain or increase the GFR. Next. Well, this glomerular filtrate of 180 liters per day, continuously, every day, there are 180 liters. And it contains the solutes with a particle diameter less than 10 nanometers. Uh, this means that uh, albumin will not pass, the blood cells will not pass, uh, but the solutes shown here, they are all 
they all have a diameter below one nanometer. And so they pass freely and their concentration in the filtrate equals their concentration in the plasma. So you know that the sodium concentration in the plasma, for instance, is 140 uh, millimoles per liter times 180 uh, 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 every 24 hours. Uh, the kidney has to filter and handle the reabsorption of 25,000 millimoles of sodium, 18,000 of chloride, and so bicarbonate, potassium, and uh, glucose. Next. How does the, tub the tubular system reabsorb all these electrolytes, water, and solutes while it's a low pressure system. There is no pressure gradient to drive uh, the reabsorption of this huge uh, amount daily. And this is how the renal epithelial cells generate an electrochemical gradient by the sodium uh, potassium ATP pump. They have variable permeability. They can vary their permeability to electrolytes and to water. And this is affected by specialized membrane protein transporters. Channels, specific channels, these allow the passage of uh, electrolytes along their concentration gradient, uh, a passive passage. Transporters uh, or co-transporters and exchangers, these allow the passage of sodium coupled with other electrolytes or solutes against a concentration grade. They use ATP uh, to provide the, the necessary uh, energy. And of course, the, finally, the, the ions uh, uh, pass uh, along uh, osmotic and concentration gradients. Next. The main driver, the, the main uh, power producer uh, of, of reabsorption is the sodium potassium ATPase pump. The renal tubular epithelium has two surfaces. One membrane faces the lumen, uh, and this is called the apical border, and the other faces the interstitial tissue and the capillaries, and this is called the vasolateral. Uh, membrane or the vasolateral border. The sodium potassium ATPase is present only on the vasolateral uh, border. Uh, this pump uses ATP to extrude three sodium ions in exchange for two potassium ions, three sodium ions out, two potassium ions in, thereby it produces a, a negative uh, potential inside the cell, minus 70 millivolt inside the cell. It also keeps the sodium concentration inside the cell low, uh, 30 uh, millimoles, and the potassium concentration inside the cell high, 150 uh, millimoles or milli equivalent. Uh, and on the other hand, the potassium concentration outside or intravascular is, as you know, three and a half to four milli equivalents per liter. And the sodium concentration outside is 140. By doing this, it creates an electrochemical gradient for the movement of sodium ions from the lumen to the inside of the cell and uh, then to the capillaries. Uh, 
it creates a, a vectorial electrochemical uh, gradient. And sodium ions um, using channels and co-transporters, they transport other anions and other solutes with them. But the driving force is the sodium potassium uh, ATP pump. Next. The other thing, of course, is that the renal tubular epithelium, the cell membrane, unlike the cell membrane all over the body, is impermeable to water. And you have to insert proteins, specific channels, aquaporins, uh, to, to, to increase the permeability uh, to water. And this varies in the different segments of the tubule. For instance, the proximal tubule and the descending loop of Henel are highly permeable to water because they have an abundance of aquaporins, as you see, both on the uh, apical or luminal border and on the basolateral uh, border. While the thick ascending limb of Henel has no aquaporins at all. It is totally impermeable to water. And this is important when you consider um, the reabsorption mechanisms and, and the way the, the kidney eventually dilutes and concentrates uh, urine. Next. So this is the, the proximal tubule. Um, and the, the lumen uh, down is the, is the lumen of the, uh, the tubular lumen. Then there is the uh, apical border of the epithelial cell, the inside of the epithelial cell, and then the vasolateral uh, membrane faces the interstitial space. On the basolateral membrane is the uh, sodium potassium ATP uh, pump providing the electrochemical uh, gradient. On the apical side of the membrane, in the proximal tubule, there are several protein transporters for sodium reabsorption. One of them is the sodium hydrogen exchanger, as shown in this uh, figure. And of course, uh, sodium goes in, hydrogen uh, goes uh, out. And uh, because of the presence of uh, carbonic anhydrase, hydrogen promptly uh, combines with the bicarbonate to form carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide diffuses back uh, into the cell. And uh, again, carbonic anhydrase inside the cell uh, and it breaks into bicarbonate and hydrogen. Hydrogen recirculates between the cell and the lumen, while the bicarbonate exits the cell together with sodium through a sodium bicarbonate co-transport. And so uh, when you inhibit carbonic anhydrase by uh, acetazolamide, uh, you get uh, natriuresis and uh, loss of uh, sodium and bicarbonates in urine and you inhibit sodium reabsorption and, and you get diuresis. Acetazolamide, however, is a weak diuretic. Although the proximal tubule is actually the site of absorption of 65% of all tubular sodium. But it's a weak diuretic because of two factors. First, there are other mechanisms of sodium reabsorption in the proximal tube, uh, like the uh, sodium glucose transporters, SGLT1 uh, and 2 uh, co-transporters, and like the sodium chloride uh, co-transporters, 
and, uh, and others. Sodium is also co-transported with amino acids. So there are other mechanisms that are not facilitated by carbonic anhydrase and not inhibited by acetazolamide. The other factor, of course, is that this is an inhibition of proximal sodium and bicarbonate reabsorption. Uh, but when the, when the filtrate passes through the uh, ascending loop of Henle and through the distal tubule, uh, sodium is, uh, part of the sodium is, is reabsorbed again. The SGLT2 inhibitors have an important consideration here. You know that you know that their action uh, preserves renal function. And uh, what they do, of course, they have some diuretic effect, but they, they also, by inhibiting sodium reabsorption, they increase the delivery of sodium and chloride to the macula densa downstream in the distal tubule. And by doing so in patients with heart failure or in patients with uh, diabetes, they restore the macula densa function that has been dysfunctional by, by heart failure, that has been offset by heart failure. And, and so, the macula densa, instead of secreting vasodilators to the afferent arteriole, they secrete actually adenosine and they constrict the afferent arteriole. And, the, and this reduces the capillary hydrostatic pressure. This results initially in a decline in the GFR, but on the long term, it protects the glomerulus and protects renal function from the deleterious effect of glomerular hypertension. And this is what, what, these, uh, what these drugs do actually. They reduce the GFR initially, uh, but on the long term, uh, they protect uh, renal function. Next. So in heart failure, there is avid tubular sodium reabsorption. There is increased sodium reabsorption. In the proximal tubule, this occurs because of intrarenal mechanisms and because of neurohormonal activation. Angiotensin II is the most potent stimulus for sodium reabsorption in all segments of the nephron. Uh, in the proximal tubule, it stimulates the sodium hydrogen exchanger. In the ascending loop of Henle, it stimulates the NKCC co-transporter, the sodium potassium chloride co-transporter. Uh, and so neurohormonal activation stimulates sodium reabsorption. But there are also intrarenal mechanisms independent of neurohormonal stimulation. As we mentioned, there is increased filtration fraction in heart failure. And this delivers um, to the peritubular capillaries, it delivers uh, blood with a high concentration of plasma proteins with a high osmotic pressure. On the other hand, venous congestion results in increased interstitial tissue pressure and increased interstitial tissue pressure promotes and increases the lymphatic flow. There is an increase in lymphatic flow, several folds. And the increase in lymphatic flow washes out uh, whatever amount of proteins that are present in the interstitial tissue. So the capillary uh, 
peritubular capillary uh, plasma has increased osmotic pressure, while the interstitial tissue has reduced osmotic pressure, and this promotes uh, promotes uh, sodium reabsorption, and this increases uh, reabsorption. Also, the increase in tubular hydrostatic pressure, because as we said, the effect of venous congestion is transmitted to all four compartments because the kidney is an encapsulated organ, uh, results in slowing of tubular fluid motion, and, uh, and this allows more time for uh, sodium uh, reabsorption. Next. And this is an illustration of, of uh, what we've been seeing. These are the, the four uh, compartments in the normal uh, situation. And in heart failure, there is increased osmotic pressure in the capillary uh, uh, blood compartment. There is increased lymph flow and reduced osmotic pressure in the interstitial tissue. and um, this stimulates uh, sodium uh, uh, reabsorption. Next. And these are the uh, effects that we already mentioned about uh, renal venous uh, congestion. Uh, by Ohm's law, uh, it reduces the, it um, um, uh, increases the uh, venous pressure reduces the pressure gradient and hence reduces uh, renal blood flow. Uh, by stimulating uh, lymphatic uh, flow, it, it also increases uh, sodium uh, reabsorption. And uh, by increasing uh, tubular hydrostatic pressure and uh, capillary pressure, it leads to increased salt and, and water retention. With venous congestion, urine flow is reduced and lymphatic flow uh, is increased uh, uh, several folds. Next. And this is what happens in the thick ascending uh, limb of, of the loop uh, of Hennen. Uh, the main uh, sodium transporter here is the uh, NKCC co-transporter. And uh, it results in an electroneutral transport of uh, one sodium ion, one potassium ion, and two uh, chloride uh, ions. The, 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 the power for, for the sodium reabsorption, of course, is provided by the sodium potassium ATPase on the resolateral uh, membrane. Sodium that is reabsorbed from the lumen exits through the sodium potassium ATPase. Chloride uh, ions exit through a special chloride channel on the basolateral uh, membrane. This NKCC co-transporter, which is also present in the macula densa uh, cells, is the site of action of the loop diuretics. The loop diuretics inhibit sodium reabsorption in, in the ascending uh, limb of the loop of Henel uh, by inhibiting uh, chloride attachment to the uh, NKCC uh, core transporter. And this is their main uh, site of action whereby they uh, produce increased uh, natriuresis. But the loop of Henel has, the ascending limb of the loop of Henel has a, another very important function. We said that it is totally or almost totally impermeable to water. And at the same time, it keeps absorbing 20% of the sodium load, uh, pouring it into the interstitial tissue and back into the capillaries. As the fluid passes 
from the proximal tubule to the descending uh, lupopanel, it is isosmotic. Its concentration of solutes is like the plasma. It's 280 milliosmoles per kilogram. In the descending uh, limb of the loop of Henel, which is porous to uh, water, uh, there is progressive reabsorption of water to the interstitial uh, uh, medulla. But in the ascending limb, there is reabsorption of sodium without water. And this creates the, the famous or the well-known high concentration of solutes in the renal medulla that you keep pouring sodium without water. And this creates a strata of high uh, osmotic pressure and high concentration in the renal medulla. This is also helped by urea uh, reabsorption from uh, the collecting ducts. Uh, the result is that the water that leaves the ascending limb of the loop of Henel is actually hypoosmotic. It is uh, concentration is only 150 milliosmoles per uh, kilogram. Loop diuretics by interfering with sodium reabsorption in the thick, thick ascending limb of the loop of Henel, they also reduce the concentration strata in the renal medulla. And they interfere with water and salt reabsorption in the collecting uh, ducts. And this way they create a free water excretion. Next. And this is how the counter current multiplier system uh, acts because of two factors. First, because in the ascending, in the thick ascending limb, there is continuous pouring of sodium in the interstitium uh, without uh, water. And second, because of this uh, hairpin loop arrangement, uh, whatever water is lost from the descending limb, it is, it is reabsorbed in the uh, ascending limb. So that uh, eventually the uh, concentration in the medulla uh, reaches several strata to 600 milliosmoles or to uh, 1200 uh, milliosmoles in the deeper parts of the medulla. Next. And this is also held and maintained uh, by the counter current exchanger in the vasorecta, in the in the peritubular capillaries, uh, because uh, of the same idea, they they uh, uh, they lose water in the descending limb, and this same water is is shifted to the uh, ascending limb without the dissemination of solutes uh, in the medulla. They they cause a controlled. Um, reduction or removal of solutes uh, in the medulla, but they leave the osmotic uh, pressure high. When in heart failure, there is capillary, peritubular capillary vasoconstriction because of neurohormonal uh, stimulation and uh, circulation is slowed in, in the vasa recta, this counter current exchange system is impaired and there is enhancement of concentration of uh, solutes in the medulla, which leads to increased reabsorption from uh, the collecting ducts and further increasing sodium reabsorption and, and water reabsorption in the collecting ducts. Next. And uh, these are the mechanisms for avid tubular sodium reabsorption heart failure, intrarenal mechanisms in the loop of Henel. First, there is 
reduced delivery of sodium and water because of the exaggerated proximal tubular reabsorption. So uh, there is little uh, delivery of water to create free water excretion. The poor renal uh, blood flow in, in the vasa recta uh, we just mentioned. And, uh, and of course, uh, there is uh, uh, diminished uh, uh, natriuresis. Uh, because of stimulation by uh, angiotensin II and the other hormones. Next. And these are the pharmacological actions of, of loop diuretics. They basically block the sodium potassium NKCC2. Two, two is, is an isoform of this, uh, of this uh, co-transporter uh, protein. Um, in the loop of Hanel, uh, and so they lead to natriuresis. Uh, they reduce the renal medullary osmolality, and so they reduce the power of the kidney to concentrate during the increase free water excretion in the collecting ducts. They uh, block the same NKCC2 in the, in the macula densa. Uh, by interfering with the chloride uh, uh, absorption by uh, chloride attachment to, to the co-transporter. And hence they stimulate uh, again natrioxide synthase and, and COX-2, they lead to afferent arteriolar vasodilation uh, and actually uh, also enhance uh, natriuresis. On the other hand, their action in the macula densa causes stimulation of renin release. And so the renin uh, angiotensin aldosterone system is stimulated by the loop diuretics and this leads to a counterbalancing effect uh, by reducing uh, natriuresis. So, so the, the, the ultimate uh, result, the end result uh, of Loop diuretics is the is the resultant of, of these two uh, counterbalancing uh, effects, and um, uh, renin angiotensin system stimulation on the long term uh, by loop diuretics, of course, is uh, detrimental. But they block also another isoform, the NKCC one. And uh, this leads to direct afferent arteriolar vasodilation. So supposedly they increase GFR, but in fact, they do not increase GFR. The GFR may increase, may remain the same and may be reduced because of the multiple factors, the multiple effectors that uh, uh, affected uh, sympathetic and renin angiotensin stimulation, for instance, reduce the GFR. And uh, their uh, vasodilator effect uh, in the circulation leads to venodilatation. And in the inner ear, uh, uh, this uh, uh, blockade of the NKCC1 may be uh, the cause uh, of, uh, of the famous uh, adverse reaction in autotoxicity. Next. This shows that the loop diuretics and actually the thiazide diuretics also are, are not filtered with the glomerular filter, uh, particularly the loop diuretics. The major, uh, uh, the major route of, uh, of clearance is secretion by the proximal tubule cells. And so they are secreted from the basolateral uh, surface of the tubule cell by uh, uh, organic anion transporters one and three. Uh, and then the multi drug resistance uh, protein uh, uh, extrudes them from the apical border into uh, the lumen to reach their uh, site of action. 
as you can see, there are many substrates for, uh, for this process for the organic anion transporters. There, there are drugs, there are metabolites, there are uremic toxins. And one of these substances also is the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, drugs. And, and so uh, these might cause a diuretic resistance by interfering with the secretion of uh, loop diuretics. Next. And, and this is how non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs may compete with loop diuretic secretion in the proximal tubule. And um, uh, also they, uh, because of the inhibition of COX-2, they inhibit the formation of prostaglandins in the macular densa. So they reduce the vasodilator effect on the afferent arteriole. And because prostaglandins also have a natriuretic effect uh, on the loop of Henel and collecting duct, they reduce uh, natriuresis. And eventually they also increase the activity and the expression of the NKCC2 uh, co-transporters in the loop of Henel. And this is why non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can exacerbate uh, heart failure and can reduce, interfere with the action of the loop. Next. This is a, a map uh, of, the, of the main uh, groups of uh, diuretics and their sites of function uh, in the renal tubule. The thiazides act on the uh, distal convoluted tubule. They inhibit another uh, co-transporter in the distal tubule. This is a sodium chloride uh, co-transporter. Uh, the distal convoluted tubule is responsible only for around 5% of sodium reabsorption. This is why the action of thiazide diuretics is weaker than the action of uh, loop diuretics. But this uh, map shows us the potential for Sequential nephron blockade, that is uh, particularly when you face uh, resistance to loop diuretics, you may use combination diuretic therapy either in the proximal tubule, SGLT2 inhibitors or acetazolamide or uh, thiazides uh, to, to uh, enhance uh, the diuretic action. Next. And finally, this is what happens in the, in the collecting ducts, the site of action of uh, aldosterone and the antidiuretic uh, hormone. And aldosterone, of course, is upregulated in uh, heart failure. And uh, in the collecting uh, duct, the, the principal uh, cells uh, are the site of... Uh, the epithelial sodium channels on the apical membrane. And aldosterone stimulates the, the production and action of the epithelial sodium channels and also stimulates the, the, the power, uh, the power uh, uh, producer uh, sodium potassium uh, ATPase. And so it increases uh, sodium uh, reabsorption. Uh, next. And unlike the, the other uh, parts of the tubule where sodium is reabsorbed in combination with, uh, with other uh, anions and with other electrolytes, in the principal cells of the collecting duct, sodium is reabsorbed alone uh, through a specific sodium channel. And therefore it creates negative uh, charges in the lumen. And this negative voltage may reach as high as, high, as minus 50 uh, millivolts. And this is the main uh, driver of uh, potassium secretion through specialized potassium channels along the electrostatic gradient. 
And this is how hypokalemia uh, occurs uh, because of uh, hyperaldosteronism as a result of heart failure and as a result of uh, increased sodium delivery by the diuretics and stimulation of the renin angiotensin system uh, by the loop diuretics. Next. And this is the last slide because we must say one word about the natriuretic peptides. And the natriuretic peptides are a salutary system that uh, helps improve uh, circulatory dynamics and, and renal function in, in congestive heart failure. And uh, as shown in this figure, they uh, uh, cause vasodilatation of the afferent arteriole and increase uh, renal blood flow. Um, and, uh, and they antagonize the sympathetic induced vasoconstriction and they antagonize the angiotensin induced avid sodium reabsorption uh, in the ascending loop of Henel and in the collecting uh, duct. Uh, this is how they increase uh, natriuresis and increase the GFR. And also, of course, they reduce the systemic vascular resistance and increase the cardiac output, leading to improvement of uh, renal blood flow. However, unfortunately, in congestive heart failure, uh, the, there is um, uh, down regulation of the uh, natriuretic peptide receptors, and there is uh, upregulation of the um, uh, of the endopeptidase of the neutral endopeptidase uh, enzyme, and so the natriuretic uh, peptide system is dysfunctional in in patients with uh, congestive heart failure. But you can uh, improve this and place it by uh, secubitril uh, valsartan uh, restore some of the useful actions of natriuretic peptides. This is the last slide. Uh, thank you. And شكرا جزيلا يا دكتور شريف انا هشام صلاح محاضره قيمه جدا وطبعا ان ديبث ازاي حضرتك عامل ايه ان ديبث ديسكشن يعني اوف ذا of the nephron من اوله لاخره وال sites of action of the different diuretics كلام قيم جدا يعني فبنشكر حضرتك جدا على ال شكرا يا شكرا شكرا والدكتور أحمد هاي دكتور أحمد دكتور أحمد شحات أنت سمعني يا شام أنا حضرتك يا دكتور شريف هو أحمد فين؟ يمكن يكون نام عموما يعني احنا احنا مش هيضيف حاجة يعني كتير بس يعني هو محاضرة جميلة جدا بس طبعا أنا عايز أطمن الداخلين دكتوراهات يعني احنا ما بنسألش إن ديبث قوي كده ولا حضرتك بتسأل ولا احنا بنسأل 
ديت مور اوف يعني ساينتفيك ديسكشن عشان اللي عايز يعرف ان ديبث انفورميشن اباوت ذا باث اوف فيزيولوجي اند هاو دي ميديكيشنز ورك فيبقوا عارفين اكتر اباوت ذس يعني بس يعني عشان الناس ما تقلقش يعني هو الحقيقه هو الحقيقه انه هو في حاجتين في الحكايه دي يا هشام اول حاجه انه الفيزيولوجي والبيزك ساينسز دول هم اساس البراكتس اوف ميديسن ده اكيد طبعا اه لا باس اطلاقا بان الواحد يبقى عارف الدنيا ماشيه ازاي طبعا تاني حاجه ان انا الستيمولس للمحاضره دي ان انا لقيت في مقاله جديده في الجاك من الجاك لقيت فيها كل الكلام ده ولقيت ان انا مش عارف الكلام ده كويس فبس قعدت عرفته كويس عشان احكيه لكم لا بالعكس احنا اعتقد ان الجميع استمتع جدا بالمحاضره والحقيقه هي محاضره قيمه جدا جدا يعني و اي ثينك انه كلنا استفدنا بس في نفس الوقت شريف عنده القدره على تقديم السهل الممتنع الحاجات الصعبه الحقيقه بيقدمها باسلوب شيق جدا وبيفصلنا واحنا الحقيقه نفسنا نسمع دايما الفيسيولوجي وال وات بيوند التريتمنت الحاجات اللي احنا ما بنبقاش فاهمينها بنفهمها دايما من خلال محاضرات في الحقيقه شكرا يا دكتور شريف احمد شحاته بقى دلوقتي هيقول شريف انا مع حضرتك يا دكتور شريف حضرتك سامعني يا دكتور شريف انا كان من بيت ناسج وسامعينك دكتور شريف ايوه انا سامعك يا احمد أحمد كلنا سامعينك اتفضل ابدأ طيب خلاص شكرا دكتور شريف على المحاضرة القيمة جدا احنا في الجزء الثاني من المحاضرة هنتكلم على الجزء البراكتيكال هاو هاو تو يوز الدايوريتكس ان كلينيكال سيتويشن أول حاجة بنقول ناتشرال هيستوري اوف هارت فيليرز كاركترايز باي ابيسودز اوف اكيوت دي كومبنسيشن ان ذا فورم اوف سيستميك فينس كونجشن لايك لور ليم اديما اسايتس Or left-sided congestion in the form of dyspnea, orthopnea, or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Symptoms of congestion usually associated with increased. Is associated with increased morbidity and mortality, and associated with increased socioeconomic burden. And congestion is the main reason for seeking urgent medical advice in the setting of heart failure. Congestion often develop over an extended period of time. زي ما دكتور شريف كان شرح بيبقى في volume overload وال volume overload بيبتدي قبل ما frank symptoms of heart failure develop. Minority of patients with acute heart failure present with low perfusion, and this makes the diuretic therapy a corner stone of therapy in heart failure. Next. What's the mechanism of congestion? زي ما دكتور شريف كان شرح ال intracellular وال extracellular comportments بالتفصيل. Uh, congestion means the accumulation of extracellular fluid that lead to increased cardiac filling pressure. Filling pressure as integrated as a result of systolic and diastolic dysfunction, plasma volume overload, and venous capacitance and compliance. The neurohormonal activation leads to increased renal sodium and water avidity. Sympathetic output lead to vasoconstriction of splanchnic vessels and venous capacitance that is impaired with chronic congestion and increased sympathetic output. Interplay of all of these mechanisms leads to development of extracellular fluid accumulation. Next. Volume overload and congestion, they are used usually interchangeably. However, they are two separate entities. About half of patients hospitalized for acute heart failure gained less than one kilogram weight during the, month, during the month prior to admission. Volume overload incompletely correct, incomplete characterizes the pathophysiology of acute heart failure and redistribution of volume may contribute. 
زي ما دكتور شريف شرح في فرق ما بين الفلويد فوليوم اوفرلود وفي فرق ما بين المال ديستريبيوشن اوف ذا فلويدز بتوين ذا انترستيشال سبيس اند ذا انترافاسكولار فوليوم اجين وي هاف تو كلاريفاي ذا تشينجز اوف ويت ان بيشنتس وذ هارت فيلير Heart failure may be associated with cachexia, associated with loss of weight, not increased of weight. And cachexia may result in loss of plasma protein, reducing plasma oncotic pressure, hampering plasma refilling from the interstitial. On the opposite hand, weight loss during hospitalization not necessarily associated with improved in hospital or post-discharge morbidity or mortality. And weight gain may be associated with poor outcome. Next. The European Society of Cardiology guideline for diagnosis of treatment of, heart, of acute and chronic heart failure recommend to distinguish between the two entities of acute fluid redistribution from the true volume overload in patient presenting with congestion. However, there is no class recommendation. And diuretic is the main way to relieve this excess volume. Next. How to detect the congestion in heart failure? The gold standard is the invasive measures, either the use of the right side catheter to show the right ventricular filling pressure or a widget catheter in the pulmonary capillaries, the Swankan catheter. However, they have many drawbacks. They are invasive in its nature with risk of infection, risk of bleeding, and etc. And in the clinical trial, like the ESCAPE trial, the use of pulmonary artery catheterization in comparison to the serial clinical assessment, there was no difference in the outcome of the patient. Therefore, direct hemodynamic evaluation should be reserved for patients with either cardiogenic shock or refractory pulmonary edema with class 2P recommendation or in case with ambiguous hemodynamic status. Next. The clinical evaluation of patients uh, with pulmonary congestion, how can we know if the patient reaches eovolemia or not? We have many tools other than invasive strategy. We have the clinical judgment in the form of evaluation of jugular venous pressure or sculpting the back revealing the lung crackles or the use of echocardiogram to evaluate the inferior vena cava for post collapsibility and its diameter or the Doppler pattern on the mitral inflow using E velocity, E over E prime plus T, or deceleration time, or the use of lung ultrasound. All of these clinical measurements of congestion have been tested against invasive strategy. And the jugular venous pressure is the most important clinical parameter to assess the congestion. It has a specificity that reaches about 80%. Not only jugular venous pressure can detect elevated right filling pressure, but it follows the left side in about 80% of patients, and it can be repeated every day. Next. Determination of avolemia is very difficult in the clinical practice, and about only 15% uh, that have been evaluated by the treating physician in the dose acute heart failure trial to be the avolemic after the congestive therapy. Congestion at discharge is a very strong predictor of poor outcome and readmission. Therefore, we should reach eovolemia and relief of this near or similar body weight loss when the patient were stable are poor markers of decongestion. At the moment, no reliable practical bedside test exists to determine eovolemia. However, we can use all of the previous mentioned method, clinical evaluation of the patient, the use of technique like the echo or lung ultrasound. Next. Most of the non-invasive clinical tests, as I said, have been a surrogate for the increased filling pressure. Biomarker has advantage of easy to measure, and it can be repeated. Here, the brain and the theoretic peptide, either B in the B or pro B in the B or A in the B, have both powerful diagnostic uh, capability and the prognostic capability. However, the use to direct uh, decongestive therapy is not important or haven't been shown in the randomized clinical trials. Novel uh, agents like adrenomedallarine or carbohydrate antigen 125 or soluble CD 146 are novel biomarkers that can reflect congestion better than natriuretic peptides. Next. 
Also, evaluation of hemoglobin concentration is very important as a marker of decongestion and reaching euvolemia. However, again, like natriuretic peptide, they can't guide the therapy, and only late hemoconcentration at the last days of decongestion is associated with improved outcome. They are poor candidates to guide decongestive therapy because they are surrogate for relative reduction in plasma volume in two time points. They are not a marker of absolute reduction of plasma volume relative between two points. Also, changes in the hematocrit are small and can be related to either bleeding for lipotomy or other causes rather than decongestion. Next. Increase of plasma creatinine is frequently or worsening of the renal function is frequently interpreted in clinical practice as, as an end point to stop diuretic therapy. However, this is not true. Even with increase in serum creatinine, we should not automatically stop further decongestive therapy, and we should resort to other tools, as I said before, clinical examination and echocardiogram or natriuretic peptide. Clinical outcomes are extremely poor if the patient is discharged with ongoing congestion in the face of worsening renal function. Next. Multiple parameter-based evaluation of congestion pre-discharge is important to use. We should use clinical, con clinical signs like relief of dyspnea, relief of orthopnea, jugular venous pressure, hepatomegaly, six-minute walk test, or technical support using X-ray, vena cava, or lung ultrasound. Next. What's the goal of therapy in acute decompensated heart failure? One, to achieve decongestion. Two, to ensure adequate organ perfusion. Three, maintaining guideline-directed medical therapy like S inhibitors, sacopatrial valsartan, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, and etc. Once eovolemia have been achieved, loop diuretic should be continued at the lowest dose possible that can maintain eovolemia without impairing the cardiac forward flow. Additionally, enrollment of patients in a detailed multidisciplinary heart failure care management is very important to increase the adherence of the therapy, to better up titration of disease-modifying drug, and the cardiac rehabilitation. Next. This slide is one of the most important slides that I will show today. How to approach a patient with acute heart failure. First, acute treatment should start as early as possible with loop diuretics. And if the patient is naive for diuretic, we should start with a dose that is equivalent to or more than 20 milligram rosimide or equivalent dose from torsimide or pumtanide. If the patient is not is not, not naive to loop diuretics, we should start one to two times the 24-hour oral home dose, but we should here start intravenously because patients with acute heart failure have bowel edema and the bioavailability is low, especially with frosimide because the bioavailability is very variable. It ranges from 10% up to 90%. And in the dose acute heart failure study, they divide the patients in two groups. The high dose group, they started with 2.5, the home oral dose. Then we evaluate the patient early within one hour uh, by two things. We, we uh, search for a spot urinary sodium and to assess the average urine output. If the, urinary, if the urine sodium spot test is more than 50 to 70 milli equivalent per liter, or the urine flow is more than or equal 100, 150 milli per hour, this means the success. And the congestion, we should start, we should continue with the dose, repeat the similar dose every 12 hours. If one of these, if not, we can't achieve adequate urine flow or adequate naturesis, known by the low urine sodium spot test, we should double the dose of intravenous diuretic and assess within six hours. If it's still below the, the range, we should repeat until maximal dose of loop diuretic should be obtained. The loop diuretic have a selling level, selling levels which mean the maximal, the maximal dose of diuretic that can achieve naturesis. But increasing the dose, the selling is reached. We can't increase the diuresis more. However, we increase the time during which the renal threshold is above the naturesis. 
FOB after 24 hours. Next. Next. After 24 hours, we should evaluate the patient for the following. If the patient, if the patient achieve urine output of three to five liter, then the diuretic dose should be continued the same till decongestion is achieved. Otherwise, doubling the loop diuretics is reaching the maximal dose, as I said, and increase the time at peak diuresis. If can't be achieved, we go for sequential nephron blockade by using mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist or use of acetazolamide or use of sodium glucose transporter to inhibit it. If not, ultrafiltration is used only at a bailout situation for patients that couldn't be congested adequately with pharmacotherapy. Predischarge congestion evaluation, according to the figure I said before, we look for the jugular venous pressure, we look for the echo parameter for the inferior vena cava, mitral inflow, and we can use biomarkers like BNB. Next. Some of the problems that can arise with the use of diuretics is electrolyte disturbances like hyponatremia, hypokalemia, or hyperkalemia. Hyponatremia can be divided into two major groups. Either hyponatremia may arise due to dilution or due to depletion. How we can differentiate between both conditions? In patients with depletion, there is a clinical picture or a volume overload. We see lower limb edema, elevated jugular venous pressure, and inappropriately high urine osmolarity. Typical, we can see this patient with acutely decompensated heart failure. In case of depletion, the reverse, we can see the patient is dehydrated with low urine osmolarity, and the treatment is different. In patients with dilutional hyponatremia, we should limit the water intake by fluid restriction and promote distal nephron flow using loop diuretics, hypertonic saline, acetozolamide. In patients with depletion, we saw that the reverse. We should stop diuretic therapy and calculate sodium deficit and administer hypertonic saline either in boluses or continuous infusion. Take into consideration we should not correct more than 8 milli equivalent per liter per 24 hour. Otherwise, osmotic demyelination syndrome will develop. Hypokalemia, if the patient saw potassium less than 3.5 milli equivalent per liter, we should obtain urgently arterial blood gases and ECG to avoid uh, any critical situation. Acidosis or something severe derangement or TCG changes because of severe hypokalemia. Physical examination usually normal in this patient. We should correct hypokalemia by intravenous preparation and don't forget to correct magnesium and it may help to correct potassium as well. Hyperkalemia usually arises in patients with chronic kidney disease, especially with the use of renin angiotensin aldosterone system antagonist. Here we, uh, we start if there is life threatening arrhythmia, calcium to stabilize the membrane potential. Otherwise, methods like sodium bicarb or inhaler sympathomimetics to shift the potassium inside the cells and the diuretic therapy. Next. In patients with chronic heart failure, loop diuretics recommended to prevent symptoms and signs of congestion. It is the only group that is class one recommendation is patient with reduced mid-range for preserved ejection fraction, all the spectrum, HEF, REF, or HEF, PEF. The prognostic effect is still unknown. However, some studies show that the diuretics may, may improve the mortality. However, these meta-analysis uh, used small trials and it was withdrawn because it can't be validated in another one. Generally, it is advised to use the lowest possible dose often needed to be adjusted according to the individual need. Next. The optimal dose of loop diuretics following discharge is not known. There is no standard use. However, patients who develop acute heart failure episode while receiving a loop diuretics before admission, higher dose may be needed. In case this previous loop diuretic frozy might shift to another one like pumtanide or torsamide because of the better bioavailability and longer half life. The chronic use of thiazide in a stable ampullatory setting or sequential nephron blockage should not be used. 
Defining the most appropriate outpatient dosing can be difficult, require follow-up, frequent visit in the outpatient clinic, and the early post-discharge period. It is very important to reassess lobe diuretics need following initiation of therapy, and it may be of very important to uh, adopt methods like self-measuring urine chloride by the patient uh, using a stick to determine the need of maintenance loop diuretics in the ambulatory setting. Later information is available on just continuing loop diuretic and contemporary treating heart failure patients. And baseline investigation, including physical examination, echo, B, and B measurement, were not capable to predict which patient loop diuretic should be down titrated or uh, shouldn't be given at all. Should be left to the discretion of the treating physician. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. محاضرة طبعا شيقة ومعلومات ممتازة نفتح باب الدسكشن دكتور شريف حضرتك معنا أنا معك دكتور أحمد كلمنا على جزء مهم day to day practice الحقيقة treatment of heart failure أحمد عندي سؤال سريع على الدياوريتيك ريزيستنس امتى نقول ان العيان ده resistant to the to diuretics and we should uh, adopt a different strategy in order to congest the patient. تمام هو دكتور محمد زي ما قلنا في الالجوريزم كده بيبقى فيه الانيشيال ايفالويشن ده اللي بيبقى في اول ساعه من دخول العيان بنعمل بعديها نشوف اليورين فلو وبنشوف كمان اليورين صوديوم. لو لقينا ان ما فيش جود اتشيفمنت بنبتدي انسكاليت الدوز بنسكاليت لغايه فين لغايه اما نوصل للسيلنج بوينت بتاعه اللوب دايوريتكس السيلنج بوينت دي غالبا بتكون من 400 ل 600 ملي جرام لوب دايوريتكس لازكس لو قدرنا نوصل للدوز دي واليورين فلو از سلاجش لازم نلجا ساعتها لحاجه ثانيه للسيكونشال نفرون بلوكيد لو عملنا سيكونشال نفرون بلوكيد وما لقيناش برضه نفس التارجت اللي احنا عايزينها اليورين فلو 100 ل 150 بير اور يبقى هنا لازم ان احنا ممكن نبدا لبيل اوت سيتويشن زي الالترا فلتريشن في معلومه بس يمكن ما قلتهاش ان اليورين صوديوم سبوت تيست ده بيتعمل في الفيرست اور انما ما بنعملوش بعد كده في الفولو اب لا عند ست ساعات ولا عند 24 ساعه في كمان نقطه يمكن ما وضحتهاش يعني قوي يعني بنعتمد على اليورين اوت بوت بس ان احنا ان اوردر تو اتشيف ا جود يورين اوت بوت نقول العيان ده هو يعني في طريقه للدي كونجيشن يبقى تمام بالاضافه الى خمسه مثلا لتر في يورين اوت بوت هو ده ده بعد 24 ساعه اه لكن تمام. ما بنعتمدش ما بنعتمدش على يورين صوديوم لا اليورين صوديوم بنعتبر بنعتمد عليه بس في الفيرست 1 اور بعد كده ات از نوت فاليد تو يوز ات بعد 1 اور بنعتمد على اليورين اوت بوت بس اون ذا اوبوزيت هاند لازم ان احنا متاكدين ان البلاد بريشر از اديكويت ان العيان مش كولد انه مش هايبو برفيوزد لازم الحاجات دي تتحط في الاعتبار برضه ما بياخدش معنى ستيرويد يعني ما عندوش كرونيك كيدني ديزيز كل الحاجات دي بناخدها في الاعتبار هو هل في حد بيستعمل اليورينري صوديوم سبوت تيست ده في مصر؟ الحقيقه لا يا دكتور شريف انا ما استخدمتوش قبل كده بس جايز يكون احنا عشان ما بنتكلمش مع بتوع المعمل كتير. جايز لو احنا يعني إن ابتدينا نتكلم معاهم عليه جايز ان هم يستخدموه. انا طالما عندي يورين اوت بوت حاجه واضحه وبتقدر تعمل لي مونيتورنج للعيان اور باي اور فانا متهيألي هو هيبقى اوف اكاديميك انترست ما اعرفش راي حضرتك ايه يا دكتور شريف هو بس هو ات مي بي مور اكوريت ان ميجرنج الدايوريتيك ريسبونس لانه كمان الدايوريتيك ريسبونس بيتقاس از يورين اوت بوت او صوديوم Uh, excretion in relation to the dose. Yani you should take into consideration the dose that you did. 
لكن انا ما اعتقدش انه حكايه السو... I think انه حكايه السوديوم ميجرمنت دي ميبي يعني ميبي اكسبيرمنتال حتى في بقيه انحاء العالم يعني طيب امتى امتى يا احمد نستخدم الميتولازون يعني يعني هل هل في سريشولد معين في وقت معين ولما بنستخدمه بنستخدم سنجل دوز ولا دبل ديلي دوز رايك ايه هو احنا في البوزيشن بيبر بتاعه اليوروبيان 2019 هم كانوا بيمفسايز ان احنا تو انكري قبل ما نبتدي السيكونشال نفرون بلوكيد لازم نوصل للماكسيمال دوز اوف لوب دايوريتكس لو وصلنا للماكسيمال لوب اللي اتكلمنا عنها 400 الى 600 ملي جرام من اللوب دايوريتكس والريسبونس سبورت ساعتها بنلجا للسيكونشال بلوكيد السيكونشال بلوكيد بتتعمل ممكن من الميتولازون وبتتعمل بطريقه ان هو يبقى بي تيكن 1 اور بيفور الدوز بتاعه البولس دوز اوف دايوريتكس علشان الانسيت اوف اكشن بتاعه ديليد غير اللوب دايوريتكس ممكن نبتدي ب 2.5 لغايه 5 لغايه 10 اب تو 20 ملي جرام الثيازايد دايوريتكس الميتولازون يعتبر ثيازايد لايك او سبيشال Special molecule in the thiazide group. The other thiazide, the claim is that they should not be used in patients with renal impairment. However, there are ongoing trials that they can be used in renal impairment. They are not patients. working, not effective. Okay. Yes, so they are building up of organic acids, but there are ongoing trials that explore their diuretic effect in the presence of renal impairment. When do you go to the ultra filtration? يعني يعني ايه البوينت اللي ساعتها اقول لا العيان ده هو لازم يعمل الترا فلتريشن هل في كريتيريا معينه بتاع نعتمد عليها تمام يا دكتور محمد تمام في كريتيريا زي ما برده هنرجع الستبس اللي اخذناها ماكسيمال دوز لوب نوت وركينج ان جو فور سيكوينشال بلوكيد نوت وركينج هننقل للنقطه الثالثه الالترا فلتريشن الترا فلتريشن بيل اب بيل اوت سيتويشن لو احنا فشلنا في ان نوصل لماكسيمال دوز وذ اديكويت دايريسز او سيكوينشال بلوكيد والكلام على الالترا فلتريشن انه هاف ماني درو باكس زي في ريسك اوف انفكشن زي في ريسك اوف بليدنج ان هو انفيزيف ان هو ما كانش فيه فرق في الكلينيكال اوت كام في الـ في الترايلز لكن ده برضو في اون جوينج ترايل على الكنترولد بريفلر بريفرال فينو فينس الترا فلتريشن ممكن تكون اوف هيلث عيان ضغطه بيقع مع الانترافينس دايوريتيك انفيوجن نعمل ايه؟ نقلل الجرعه شويه ولا نلجا لفازو بريسورز؟ ايه رايك؟ اعتقد نلجا لفازو بريسورز اوكي وكمان في في شويه حاجات احنا عليها ستاديز ويمكن تعمل alternative routes for management of diuretic resistance زي use of SGLT2 inhibitors مش بس في ال chronic cases لكن كمان جايز في ال acute cases وجاي وزي برضو في study على ال acetazolamide مع ال مع ال loop diuretics وأظن إنه في أحمد قال لي إنه في حد في الاسم بيعمل استدي uh, على الاسيتازولاميد مع الـ او على الاس جي اس جي ال تي 2 نيبر دكتور شريف هو اللي دكتور شريف قاله هو السيكونشال نفرون بلوكيد سواء بنستخدم السيكونشال نفرون بلوكيد في البروكسيمال كونفوليوت تيوبولز زي مثلا صوديوم جلوكوز كو ترانسبورتر انهبيتور او الاسيتازولاميد او ان بلوكيد الديستال بارت اوف ذا نفرون بالثيرايد ودكتور حسام خليفه هو اللي بيعمل حاجه مع دكتور مجدي على الصوديوم جلوكوز كود ترانسبورتر انهبيتور لكن احنا ما عندناش يا احمد نعم. بقول لك أنا انت رديت السؤال اللي كان دكتور عبد الغني بيتكلم عليه حكايه هل نزود فازو بريسور ولا نقلل الدايوريتيك بمنتهى البساطه كده وقلت نعمل كذا لا طبعا هي ديبيندز اون ذا فوليوم ستاتس لان انت ممكن يكون عندك ريلاتيف هايبوبوليميا فالانسر از نوت ذات سيمبل انت مش في كل السيتويشنز هتزود الفازو بريسورز ولا في كل السيتويشنز هتقلل الدايوريتكس هو احنا بالنسبه للسيرم بالنسبه لليورينري صوديوم ده ليه سبيسيفيك سيتويشنز طبعا المفروض بنستخدمه فيها 
واحنا اوريدي احنا احيانا بنعمل كده في بعض العيانين بالذات الناس اللي عندها ريزيستنت هايبوفوليميا في بعض الحالات بيبقى عندها سورت اوف سولت ويستنج نفراتيز او عندها اذر سورسز ان بيحصل فيها صوديوم لوس بطرق اخرى سواء عن طريق الجي اي تي او كده فعيانين اللي عندهم السكندري هايبر الدوستيرونيزم سم تايمز اتس اولسو امبورتنت انك انت خاصه لو مش ع... العيان ووتر لوجد بلاقيه في نفس الوقت عنده سيجنيفيكانت هايبوناتريميا فانا قصدي فيها سبيسيفيك سيتويشنز احنا لازم بنستخدم فيها اليورينري سوديا قلت بس اضيف النقطه دي شكرا يا دكتور هشام هو بس دكتور محمد كان بيتكلم في السيتنج ان احنا عيان كونجستد فده كان عشان كده ردي كونجستد يعني وي مينز وي هاف تو دايوريز ذا بيشنت if we have not adequate blood pressure اكيد الحل ان احنا we have to raise it to increase the renal perfusion to increase the delivery of diuretics to the renal nephrons وبالتالي to achieve diuresis زي ما حضرتك قلت الصوديوم مهم جدا في بعض السيتويشن صحيح طبعا وفي الاول لازم نكسكلود السودو هايبوناتريميا اللي بتحصل في حالات الماركت ديسليبيديميا زي الفاميليال هايبر كوليستروليميا وبعدين هو مهم للتفريق ما بين الدايلوشنال هايبوناتريميا او يكون زي ما حضرتك قلت السبيسيفيك سيتويشن او جينيتيك سيتويشن اللي بيبقى فيها لوس اوف صوديوم في اليوم. اوكي. طب انا اعتقد ان نسيب الناس تروح تستريح بقى <تصفيق> بس هو شكرا يا دكتور شريف وشكرا يا احمد شكرا يا فندم شكرا يا يلا تصبح على خير حضرتك من اهلك سلام 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 يا دكتور شريف شكرا جزيلا لحضراتكم انا معلش الارسال كان قطع الدقيقتين اللي فاتوا بشكر طبعا استاذنا الكبير الدكتور الشريف الطبي ودايما في انتظار الحقيقه المزيد من مشاركته العلميه في انشطه الاسم ونشكر كمان الدكتور احمد الحاكم شكرا جميعا صباح الخير